Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen welcome back to another live stream so in this stream we're gonna do something a bit different we're gonna be learning some shaders from scratch by doing so basically I'm gonna teach you hopefully I'm gonna try my best to teach you how to uh, write shaders uh, from scratch we're gonna start with the basics of the basics then hopefully at the end of this live stream you're gonna have uh, a simple 3d looking moon you know it's not gonna be anything fancy you know this is just for beginners <laughs> uh, but it would be probably something that you're proud of hopefully uh, and we'll see how it goes uh, all right so let's go let's go let me just make sure everything is okay all uh, right uh, everything seems good to me I think uh, oh, oh my bad I haven't I haven't uh, posted yet crap oh I see <laughs> uh, okay live all right let's go okay so let's get started I think let me bring out the chat here and let's go so i'll be using godot engine as my platform where i'm gonna write the shaders but you can use whatever platform whatever shader language doesn't matter godot engine uses kind of like a modified glsl um, but really it doesn't matter but the concept will stay the same basically just syntactic differences right there and some convenience stuff either way let's actually make a little i guess 2d scene and let's put a sprite and let's put a shader here real quick so material material new shader material shader new shader and we're gonna create a shader here there you go this is gonna be a simple shader where we're gonna try to create a 3d moon at the end of this string okay so let's go ahead and do this so we're not gonna be using anything fancy no vertex no light just fragment and I'll I'll tell you what is this about so we have this is the the shader code right so it's kind of like C syntax kind of so we have this fragment function and basically this fragment function gets called for every single pixel that is covered by this texture right here uh, so uh, and like the more I zoom in into this um, texture like the more pixels uh, from this texture that I have on my screen so the more this function gets called now the thing is this is the shaders are ran by the GPU not the CPU and so what is the difference between the GPU and the CPU is that the GPU have a lot of little cores while the CPU have some buffed you know uh, cores but they're just you know uh, not much of it right so you usually have uh, double core or dual core I think yeah or three cores four cores six cores some people even have 32 cores but like GPUs have even 1000 cores and so on but they're much simpler than CPU cores either way why I'm telling you this because basically the CPU is super good at doing complex uh, calculations and complex computations but the thing is since we have only so much cores we can only do so much one, at one time right so the cpu is usually used for uh, sequential computation where you do task one then task two then task three so sequentially and hello gavin Tranquilino. welcome to the live stream how is it going okay so that's the CPU now the GPU since they, they have a lot uh, it have a lot of cores it can do a lot of stuff at once of course every core is not as powerful as a CPU core it's um, I'll give you an analogy in a second uh, but you got the point so the GPU can actually do a lot of works a lot of work at once and actually I do know of a really good website that you could also check out after this stream I don't remember the name I think I'll just search yeah there you go the book of shaders this is very good so after this stream this is probably your best next step uh, hopefully so let's go and there's actually a very good illustration here I remember it's been a long time since I've 
seen this book actually uh, what is a shader okay yeah there you go cool all right so there you go so this is a CPU right you have this pipe okay hold on let me put the chat okay cool so this is the CPU you have a pipe right this is some task uh, and yeah, you, you can only do one task at a time. Now this is the GPU. <laughs> Actually, no, no, that's not, that's not, <laughs> that's the CPU with a lot of tasks, right? So only one at once could go through the pipe, but then it, it comes the GPU. The GPU have a lot of small cores. So notice that this is a big pipe. This is a small pipe, but there is a lot of them. So you can actually process this, all this small tasks at once. So that's the GPU, that's the CPU. This is a very, very good illustration. And yeah, I really recommend after this stream, reading through this whole book. It's very, very good. Um, either way, let's, oh yeah. And one analogy I like to think about it myself is like the CPU is an engineer, you know, in a company, right? Or in a factory, right? And the GPU, uh, like the like the CPU core is an engineer and the GPU core is just like a, a regular worker in a factory now you have a lot of regular workers in a factory but you have only a bunch of engineers you know so uh, that's how it goes so like if you have a lot of work to do you would probably give that to the factory workers right uh, but if you have some complex designs that you need to think about and solve problems and such, you're going to give it to your uh, small amount of engineers that you have in your factory, right? So, of course, like both the CPU and the GPU, you know, does a huge role in making this possible. So, like a factory without engineers <laughs> is uh, <laughs> going to suck. And also a factory without workers is also going to suck. Both are important. So also, also, also Mythbusters have a video about it. That's interesting. Hello, yo, yo, man, 3D. Welcome to the live stream. OK, so I guess let's get started. OK, so we have this fragment function, right? Now, this fragment function, as I said, it gets called for every fragment in this texture. Or in this case, you could just say to simply uh, a pixel. There is a difference between a fragment and a pixel, but let's not go into this right now. It doesn't really matter in 2D. Well, it does matter actually. Let, let me try to explain it, I guess, anyways. So let's say we have two textures, right? We have this texture and this texture. Now the thing is, both of these textures have their own fragments, right? But the thing is, this this place right here, this area, this rectangle right here is shared between these two. So the thing is, we're going to process the, the, the fragments of both of these textures, but we only have one pixel here, right? So we got to show one fragment or the other. We're going to do a combination of these fragments. Now it depends. So here we don't have transparency. So what happens is the, the texture that is, you know, like, in front of like the texture that is drawn last is the one that gets to show its fragment into the pixel and the one that is in the you know before it you know it, like the fragments there just gets discarded right so they don't <laughs> go through the pixels anyways so now let's actually start writing some code i think uh okay cool so in godot uh, this changes uh, depending on which language you're working on and platform, etc. But in Godot, we have a color variable that is global, right? I think in uh, normal GLSL, if I remember GL color, I think, or I don't honestly remember. <laughs> Anyways, so color is equal to, and now I can give it any color I want. This got to be a vec4, which means four values. Uh, it's going to be RGBA. So the first value would be red, the second would be green, the third uh, would be blue, and the last and final one got to be transparency or actually opacity. All right, so let's see what we got. Of course, they're all floats. So let's see. Uh, let's just give it all zeros, right? For now, let's start with that. And let's just remove one of these actually. Let's move this, right? And actually, I'm going to give the opacity, I'm going to give it one. And let me save this. 
Okay, cool. There you go. So <laughs> we have wrote our first shader right now. It's just color is equal to vec4. It's equal to a constant color, which is basically black. Because, you know, when you have no red light, no green light, no blue light, well, of course, you're going to get black. I mean, black is just, or actually darkness, is just like the the lack of light, right? <laughs> now, this is not accurate in most monitors, by the way. This is just a little information right here, is the fact that your monitor is always going to be emitting light, no matter if it is black or not. Uh, unless, unless if it's a new kind of monitor called OLED, and that monitor actually shows true black. So when you see a black color in OLED display or OLED monitors, which are quite expensive, that's actually, there's no light there, like truly no light. But in actual monitors, in the regular monitors, that's not the case. There is light, it's just that there is some crystals that rotates and such uh, to give that illusion. But anyways, whatever. All right, so we can also make this, instead of typing out three values like this, we can also say vec3, vec3 0, 0.0. Now this would basic, this is basically the same as putting three zeros right here. So this is called, I think, hold on, let me try to remember the name. Man, the name just flew from my head right now. Um, hmm. Anyways, I'll try to remember it. Uh, anyways, so basically you want to construct a vector 4, right? So you can use a vec3, then one value, or a vec2 and a vec2, or a ve like one value and vec3, etc. You got the point. Yeah, it's called swizzling. Yeah, swizzling. Uh, finally, I got it. <laughs> okay, cool. So what about zero point, well, one, what about 1.0 here? Okay, it's white now because we have full red light, full green light, and full blue light. These are like the essential colors uh, when it comes to light. So when you've mixed them together, you get white, right? If you mix, uh, let's just take this back to what it was before. Uh, we don't need the vector three anymore. Okay, so this is it. Now, let's say we only, uh, we want yellow color. So, hello, Theo Paris, welcome to the live stream. So, right now, I'm just starting from the basics. So, let's say we want yellow. We just mix in full red light with full green light, and we get yellow. Uh, this is an additive color model. Um, meaning that the colors add up together, but this is going to be different from, you know, when you paint on a paper or using pencils, colored pencils. Because, uh, you know, pa when you're painting on a paper, that's not additive, that's subtractive, meaning that if you actually mix colors, you get black. So you start with white, you get black. When it comes to light, you start with black and you go to white. So the opposite. <laughs> Anyways, so right now our shader is not very interesting. We're just giving it a custom color for every single pixel. You know, that's not very fun. So how can we actually change the color depending on the pixel? Now, the problem that we have here is that since the GPU is running that fragment function for every single fragment or pixel at the same time, we don't have too much freedom on how we actually do this. Um, the best way you can do this is by actually doing calculations. So every single fragment would do calculations independent of other fragments. So like every single one mind its own business. It doesn't know anything about the others. So the best way to go about this is like your fragment is just like a function from a UV, which is position to an actual color. Hello, WoGG Gearing. Welcome to the live stream. So just imagine that you have an exam of mathematics and they tell you to, to draw the Mona Lisa, right? And you do that just by... <laughs> Let me bring up some graphical calculator. And let's say they just tell you, here you go. You have your, your X and the Y in the canvas and 
this function should map to a color. And if I run this through the whole canvas, for every single point in the canvas, it should give me the Mona Lisa, right? So <laughs> try to do it then. <laughs> so that's the way it works. Okay, so how we can actually make this different. Now, instead of using a constant, we're gonna use a variable. And what variates or like what is different from one pixel to the other is its position. So in Goda, the position is basically called UV. UV like this. This is also kind of like a global variable in this context. So let's actually say UV dot X here in the red section and zero here. Okay. So notice that the green and the blue is zero, zero, but the red, I put it UV dot X. Okay. So notice that right now I got a gradient from black to red. And this actually tells me something interesting, which is the coordinate system of this shader. Uh, here now the coordinate system can actually differ from one engine to the other and from one platform one language to the other etc But there you go. So this is how you know, right? So you go from black to uh, Red which means that the X in this place right here. It's zero the X is zero here and it keeps on going gradually until it reach one at the end of this texture from here So this is my x-axis. It goes from left to right Okay, what about my y-axis though? Okay, so here's my y-axis. It goes from zero right here to one at the end of here. So here you go, this is how you create gradients. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, so now let's spice things up a bit. Now the thing is, this is also still kind of boring because the pixels that are in the same, in this case in the same, horizontal line they have the same color you know because we're not using the UV dot X we're not taking into account the X position of the pixel in this case we're only taking into account the Y position and that's why it would never change through that so what if we make a mix between the two the UV dot Y and the UV dot X and hopefully the go dot logo didn't scare you <laughs> Okay, there you go. So we got the uv.y plus the uv.x right now. And notice what we got. And yeah, we got f of x equal to x. A linear function kind of to some degree, right? But basically, the it goes from 0, 0 to, from here to here, which is going to be 1, 1, right? In the x and the y. Actually, it's not going to be 1, 1 in this case. It's actually going to be two because both are going to be one at the, this point so we can actually divide this by two you know clamped yeah you can also clamp it sure though it does clamp in automatically for you if it goes over the maximum color uh, which is 1.0 so i i don't think i've actually mentioned this but in case if you don't know this color values goes from 0 to 1 where 0 is 0% 0 of the light and 1 is 100% right so yeah okay so here we divide by 2 and there you go though there is one exception to that clamp that I've talked to you about that that if this is more than 1 so like if you say 1.1 here in the green this won't make a difference between 1.1 and 1.0 no difference unless if you're working with hdr high definition what is it called resolution i guess i don't know exactly <laughs> either way if you're working with that then that's going to matter at that point if you have an hdr display with the hdr compatible engine i guess uh, but anyways whatever that's not the case in our case <laughs> Anyways, so that's basically it for that. Now, let's do something more interesting. Hmm, let's think about it. Okay, cool. Let's try to make a circle. How we can make a circle? Now, I think you start to understand what's going on here. We get the X and the Y of the pixel, and we need to output a color somehow. We have a function that maps UV, or the position of the pixel, to its color. <laughs> and that's how you do it. Okay, so let's see how we can make a circle using this. Now, you remember Pythagorean theorem from, I, I don't know, primary school, high school? Not sure. <laughs> Either way, 
it's basically something like this if you don't remember so x to the power of 2 plus y to the power of 2 let's say uh, less or equal to 1 for example okay so we got a circle here so this is by the way this most I I learned a lot of math through this application by just you know graphing equations and and functions and just seeing what happens how it looks and just playing with its values and such and just seeing what happens that is the best way I learned mathematics honestly I uh, I was a failure in in high school to be honest with you because I didn't understand that the whole stuff but when it comes to graphically and seeing what like especially with shaders whatever math you put in you actually see with your own eyes immediately you get feedback so you see what's happening all right so now if we have equal basically this should be r to the power of two right so this is the pythagorean theorem right and here we have the radius we can actually make a variable for the radius and there you go now we could actually control the radius of the circle let's go all right great now this actually gives us the border of the circle what if we want a disk well we could just say less than <laughs> less than that right and there you go we got the uh, inside of the circle what if we actually said less than or equal to well we get the inside and the border what if we said greater than well we get the outside of the circle so anything other than inside the circle pretty much anyways so that's basically so let's try it right now in our shader so to simplify this thing a bit I'm just gonna create a little variable just to make things a little bit more readable float x equal to uv dot x and float y is equal to uv dot y so we don't have to use uv dot y uv dot so we can just say x and y right cool so these are the x and the y values of the pixel of the pixels position cool so all right, so let's do that. We can say if, if, um, hmm. let's actually make a circle first of all. Float circle is equal to, we're going to calculate this, so x to the power of 2 plus y to the power of 2. Well, we already have the x and the y of the pixel, so uh, we could just say x times x instead of x to the power of 2 uh, plus y times y. Okay, great. Now, uh, 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 uh okay so let's check if this is less than uh, some hmm I mean the thing is let's say we want the radius by itself right so what we could do uh, to make it even simpler this is let's say this is an equation so what you would do you would remove the the power from here right and you just say SQRT here, here. this is very simple math but there you go that's basically how how it goes so r is equal to the square root of x to the power of 2 plus y to the power of 2 there you go so what we could actually do right now we could say sqrt here and say if circle is less than i don't know let's say 0 0.5 maybe and if that's the case then we let's set the color to white for example And notice, look at that. So this is a well, a quadrant of a circle. <laughs> Why? Because the actual center, uh, like the coordinate system, is actually centered here, uh, in like the mathematical coordinate system, which is like here in center, I guess. <laughs> so we gotta move this coordinate system somehow, though, which is interesting. But before we do that instead of sq yeah the y is down pretty much uh the y it goes down in this case and the x goes right pretty much and it all starts from here this is the origin so let's start from this first of all so instead of saying sqrt uh, a square root actually is very very slow on computers uh to calculate it takes a lot of power right so instead of <laughs> no pun intended a lot of power <laughs> So instead of doing uh, a square root, what we could actually do, we could leave it as it was, you know, r to the power of 2. 
Since, you know, in this case, we're not really concerned about the actual radius of the circle itself. We're more concerned about the comparison of that of that uh, thing, you know, with our radius. So what we could do, what we could do is, instead of square root, we're going to remove square root here. And just uh, now we just have to make sure to make the radius itself also power of 2 when we actually compare it here. And that should be equivalent, but faster, because we don't have to do a square root anymore. That's just a little thing. Now, let's say we want to actually play with the radius of this, um, of this circle here. Uh, like Just like here, just like in this mouse right here, I want to actually play with the radius in my shader. So, because you're going to need that a lot, trust me, especially if you're like me, a graphical person, you're not, you're not very, I don't know, I don't know what you call it, <laughs> but like you're not that person who just likes to read rules and such, I guess, I don't know, anyways, never mind. <laughs> let's actually go with radius, so let's make a uniform value, this is called a uniform, so uniform float radius and there you go so now I created the uniform and now I can just use it so instead of 0 0.5 I'm just gonna use this radius right here and let's go and honestly this doesn't make a lot of sense let me just remove that variable and let's go ahead and do this okay cool let's actually right now go here now of course this would depend where we're gonna find uh, these uniforms depending on which language, which platform you're using. But there you go, right now I can actually change the radius like a slider here in my shader. Look at that. So, when it's... Huh, hold on a second, something is weird here though. Huh, hold on. Uh, am I doing this correctly? What? Ah, I see. <laughs> My bad. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I see now. So, so basically, when we're gonna have the radius one, of course, this would take the whole thing, right? It would take the whole radius. If it's zero point five, it would be halfway there. But honestly, it doesn't look halfway there. Really? Weird. No clue. Or maybe actually it is, it is. It's just that this thing keeps on fooling me. <laughs> I expect it to be here, but that's of course not the case since it's a circle. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Never mind. <laughs> Alright, so else we could also do this. Else we could actually go with a white color here, let's say. And otherwise, instead of the Godot logo. <laughs> Let's just go with the black and there you go or otherwise instead of doing it this way We can also go with zero opacity. So it is transparent Okay, so now to the next problem that we have here is the fact that how can we actually translate this coordinate system? So we have a function here and we want to translate this circle up and down We want to play with it however you want change its position instead of just being in the origin now here's a simple way of doing it. You would go to every single x and y value you have in your function, right? And so uh, this is what I'm going to, or equation, this is what I'm going to do right now. You're just going to put them in parentheses. Just wrap them in parentheses. That's, or actually, let's start simple. Let's just start with the x. I want to make the circle go left and right however I please, okay? So I'm going to start by basically going through the whole thing and wrapping every single x value. And instead of passing that x value alone, what we're going to pass, x value minus some value, minus some offset, right? So let's say x minus a, right? And here in this mode, I can actually make a variable easily like this. And look at that. Right now, we could actually change the, the position of the circle left and right. Now, how are we going to do the same thing with the y-axis? It's pretty much the same exact thing. You're just going to go to the, every single y variable you have in your equation or your function, and you're going to wrap it and go minus b, minus that offset, right? And there you go. 
let's go so now we can actually control the x and the y position of this circle let's go even further in this mouse and we can actually put here a position a b and now i can actually play with the circle however i please that's how it works <laughs> look at that <laughs> okay so let's do the same exact thing in our shader right now so instead of doing this what we could do is uh, alright so let's actually put some uniform some new uniform so we're gonna make a vec2 alright so this is a vec2 like it contains two values this is gonna be our circle position so instead of float which is one value I, I hope I can have 3d mouse move <laughs> vec2 I mean you can kind of have that actually like your mouse is in 2d right but you also have your mouse wheel so I think some volumetric applications actually do this so like you would actually you know in the 2d plane of your screen you would use your mouse right your mouse movement but then in the 3d direct in the 3d dimension or the third dimension right you would use your scroll wheel to scroll slices through that dimension <laughs> so that's possible especially if you have a fluid mouse wheel though Personally, I don't have that. I have just a simple mouse wheel, so it's not that smooth. Anyways, uh, uniform vec2 position. Cool. So we have now a uniform vec2 position. Great. Uh, all right. So how are we going to do this? We're going to wrap every single x value. Or actually, instead of doing this, since we already made this into a variable, we can actually do it here, you know. So we could say minus position dot x minus position dot y and there you go now we can actually change the position of this let's go we can change this however we want now let's make this circle in 0 0.5.5 pretty simple which is of course in the center and it have a radius of 0 0.5 which makes it perfectly fit here and you'll notice also one thing is that how much you you zoom doesn't matter you would keep on like this is what's nice about shaders about making shapes in shaders instead of just you know a raster image uh which is an image like you th that you would normally get let's say from the internet download from the internet or whatever usually so like the difference between raster and vector images is that uh, vector images doesn't lose their precision when you zoom into them because they're a bunch of mathematical expressions yeah this is good uh, but you can use whatever tool you want or whichever place you can write shaders in I just find writing shaders in Godot uh, very fun I guess and very convenient basically because I have all this editor stuff uh, but yeah uh, okay where I was again <laughs> Um, hmm. Interesting. Not for my potato. <laughs> I I don't think you need like a gaming computer for running Godot though. Should be pretty simple. Ah, uh, yeah. I was uh, talking about SVG and uh, raster. So raster is based like raster images, like PNGs, JPEGs, and stuff. They're just you know a bunch of. Um, like a matrix or a grid of pixels just like your screen and but the thing is they have a they have a determinate size so if you zoom into them enough depending on their resolution you would actually see the individual pixels in them Godot is so lightweight I love it yeah it's pretty much so you would actually see the individual pixels but of course SVG that's not the case and also shaders the more I zoom like I could just this you know this equations and this mathematical expression would run for every single pixel on my screen anyways but the only problem here though is the fact that I can actually see individual like jagged lines you know individual pixels there which is not super great it, it really tortures my eyes <laughs> it slices it up at least personally so what you would usually use to combat that in games you would use MSAA 
so multi-sampling but though the thing is about multi-sampling it wouldn't work for us since we're doing our stuff in shaders we're not using the actual geometry of the go of the engine itself which you should actually do uh, for such a thing but here we're just learning some basics of shaders like this uh, anyways but we can actually do our own MSAA using a little bit of math you know so let me see hold on a second let's go to the book of shaders uh, there is some nice stuff there actually hold on next some mm-hmm go on go on. come on bro Hmm. Where are the functions? I'm looking. Oh, there you go. Okay, cool. So, mm -hmm. so this is the gradient that I've shown you, and you could do all these kind of functions, right? This is a constant function, so it goes from zero to one. All oh, right, there you go. That's what I'm talking about. This is called. So the other unique function is known as smooth step. Given a range of two numbers and a value, this function will interpolate the value between the defined range. The two first parameters are for the beginning and the end of the transition, while the third is for the value to interpolate. This though have a, have a name. I don't remember the name. Hmm. But either way, in shaders we call it smooth step, but it does have an interesting name in math. <laughs> Anyways, so how we can actually use this to make our circle smooth? Hmm, let's see. So the thing about uh, if conditions and branches in uh, shaders, they're bad. <laughs> in like the CPU, which branches are not that performance heavy, but in the GPU, you get a big hit for branching your code. So the best code in GPU, sigmoid, exactly, yeah. Uh, hello, Lotfi. Welcome to live stream. Sigmoid. That's the name, the mathematical name of that function. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so instead of using an if condition, uh, we'd better actually make this if condition into mathematical expression, so we don't get that performance hit, right? So how we can do this? Uh, all right, let's try it out. Vec four, Vec three, one point zero here. Right, and here, uh, let's, so we need to go from zero to one. So here we could, uh, let's start simple. Let's start by just a step, right? To replace our if condition here. So how are we gonna actually do this? So you can, in my case, since I'm using Goda engine shader, I could check out the Goda engine shader doc documentation, right? So I think this one. There you go, and I have a lot of cool stuff that I can see here. So it depends on which funk, like which uh, kind of language you're using. You gotta check its documentation or reference. And here, let's try to find step function. Hmm. There you go. Okay. So the step function takes two values, a and b, and this is what it does. There you go. Pretty cool. Uh, this is a vec, so like you could use either a vec or a float in this case, basically. Uh, but yeah, you have A and B. Cool. So let's try to actually do this right now. Let's grab this guy and this guy. Let's remove this branch. And actually what we had before, we had a transparent background instead of black. So instead of putting the step here, let's actually just put 1.0 for the color and let's put this in the opacity. Oh crap, I removed that. Okay, there you go. And now we have the exact same thing as we had before. Just now we don't have any branches anymore. We don't have an if condition, okay? So our performance is the best it could be, hopefully. Right, so and also it is much natural for shaders. You can actually right now put this into a variable called circle. And there you go. <laughs> this is the circle. <laughs> now we could do all sorts of cool stuff like uh but actually let's leave that for for us some time.
time now. Anyways, let's let's stay with the smooth step right now. Let's actually make this smooth because we still have that jagged lines right now. Let's actually turn this into a smooth step and let's see the documentation again. There you go, smooth step actually takes three values. It's a hermit interpolate between A and B by C. Yeah, it's basically the sigmoid function uh, that we've seen before. Is that sigmoid, right? Let me just ver yeah, exactly, it is sigmoid, right, cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's use that. Let's use that by C, all right. So circle is smooth step from, hmm. I don't even, hold on, how did I even do that <laughs> before? Uh, I think like this. I haven't programmed shaders in a while. <laughs> ah, I think I know. Well, yeah, I know now. Hold on. There you go. Hmm, hold on a second. What the heck? Did I just forget how to do this? Hmm. Let's say float A is equal to this. And float B is equal to this. Uh, float B is equal to this. All right, and let's see how we can do this. A and B. Is that the right thing between A and B by C? Step, uh, okay. Actually, I think the B is supposed to be here. Oops. Hmm. No. Ah, what the heck? There you go, okay, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> I just remembered, but there you go. This is how I actually learn how to do shaders. <laughs> just by trying stuff up and see how, how it works, <laughs> like what happens. And then basically kind of like, uh, what is it called? Is it a PID? I think it's a PID. No, not this. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> uh, controller thing. Um, I really do not remember the name. Uh, P something. <laughs> but basically, there's a device that depends on the actual feedback that he gets. It actually adapts to it. Uh, it's used, for example, to balance. Uh, to balance, what is it? Uh, man, what's up with me? I forget names, right? <laughs> it is used to balance. What are those flying things? Come on, give me the name. <laughs> flying. Uh, <laughs> Really did not remember that. Oh yeah, drones. Oh my god. <laughs> Can't believe I forgot this name. Yeah, drones. It's used for drones, for example, to make sure it doesn't tip over. So depending on the feedback, it, it, uh, like, it makes sure to balance itself. Either way, whatever. <laughs> I spent too much time here. But right now, I actually smooth this out by just adding something here, like plus 0 0.1. Let me actually make this into, I don't know, if better here. Uniform float fetter. Right, and now I could actually play with it. So zero is like the step, like the step function. Gyroscope, um, not really, not really. But that's also a good example of that, I guess. Uh, but there you go. So right now I can actually smooth this circle however I want. And in fact, if it's negative, it would go the other way around. So now I can actually add some a bit of smoothing. So we don't really need MSAA. 
In this case, you could just say something like this, I guess. So 0 0.01 for the feather, maybe. Uh, but there you go. And it depends on where you put this, it would go in that direction, right? So in this case, we're actually smoothing towards the, the inside. But if you do it the other way around, it actually would smooth the other way around from to the outside, I think. There you go. It would smooth to the outside. You could also say divide by two and plus so you can smooth in both in both directions, right? There you go. Uh, what's up? Oh yeah, make sure to make this float. Uh, and there you go. Now it actually smooths in both directions equally. Uh, but anyways, this is fine for me. That looks pretty cool. It's smooth as butter now. Great. Okay, so let's go to the next step. Let's say we want to make a donut. Okay, just a 2D donut. <laughs> so we can use some Boolean, Boolean geometry stuff, right? So how are we gonna? We can actually do this. Well, first of all, let me put this circle into a function, right? So we can produce fun uh, circles, basically. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, not fn. It's well, not void. Float. Okay. So float circle. I'm gonna give you the UV. Right, and I'm gonna give you the. Uh, I mean, we could put the radius here too. UV and the radius. And there you go. So this is a new function we have made here. Redefinition of oh, I see, gotcha. So let's just call this R, I guess, right now. <laughs> and let's actually return some value here. So let's take this. Let's put it, I guess, here. Right, so. And let's just. Yeah, so this is our R right here. R times R. We can actually remove the, well, not really. But like we could take this out of here and we can put it here. We can also have some feather value and have the F there. Uh, or maybe we can even say in transition, I guess. An out transition, right? Float out transition. You could call these variables whatever you want. And here we can actually say float x equal to v dot x and float y is equal to v dot y. And and there you go. Now here we're just going to return this circle. Uh, instead of putting it into a variable, we're going to return it from this function, right? Mm -hmm. Plus f. So we don't have f anymore. We're going to say minus in transition here. Come on, bro. And here plus out transition. And there you go. So right now we have a function that we can reuse to make multiple circles. Cool. So let's actually make use of that right now here. So we don't need this stuff anymore. We could just say circle. Well, let's just call this C because we have a function called circle. <laughs> circle. Uh, and we're going to pass in here our UV which is basically, instead of saying float x and y, we could just say vic2 uv is equal to uv minus position, because both are vector twos. And this is basically the same thing. And now we could just pass in that uv right here. Uh, okay, circle uv comma radius. So the radius would be 0 0.5 to take the whole texture. And the in transition, let's go with 0, 0.0. Uh, actually, yeah. Hold on, no. Where is it? Is that the case? Hold on. Let's just say 0 here, please. 
and there you go. What about 0 0.1 here? Oh, actually, this is the out transition, my bad. So this should be the out transition, and this should be the in transition. Uh, okay, cool. So, mm -hmm. so the in transition is, let's say, 0 0.01. Cool, so we have circle one. Now, let's actually make a second circle. Okay, it's gonna be the same circle, right? And let's try something interesting. We're gonna make this a bit smaller. Let's change the radius, let's say, to 0 0.4, right? And let's subtract circle one, which is the bigger circle, from circle two, which is the smaller circle. There you go, you got a donut. <laughs> you just take a circle, a big circle, you take out from it a smaller circle, and there you go, you got it. And we also have smoothing, so this works perfectly. Look at that, there you go. <laughs> That's pretty cool, let's go. We don't need these uniforms anymore, I think. Or is it? Oh, my bad, the, the position. Yeah, the position. Let's remove the radius and the feather, I guess. Or we could keep the feather, actually. And we could maybe put it here. And then we can actually change it. <laughs> there you go. Anyways, so... Now, what is the next step? Well, let's actually, let me show you, let's try this out. Let's try something interesting. Let's change this circle's position, okay? And see how it goes. So I'm just gonna put like a uniform, pick to, let's say A, IDK, and uh, the UV here, okay, C1, minus uh -huh. so instead of uv you can actually say minus a well let's say inner circle position oh my god the names keeps on clashing <laughs> there you go okay and now look at that Oh crap. That's exactly how I make I made the moon in uh, in my thumbnail. I did exactly this. <laughs> Cuz I'm using Inkscape, which is a vector art program. Inkscape. This is what I use for my logos, what I use for my thumbnails. Uh pretty much let me see if I have this still here. Ah, yes, there you go. But I actually, so here's what I, how I actually made it, just to show you real quick. So I basically took a circle, right, that is white, and then I control or alt maybe, oh, well, never mind, control D, right, to duplicate the circle. I'll make it black just so I can see it. Right, did this, and then I clicked on this one, then I clicked on this, then I've gone to path difference, minus, right? So these are the Boolean operations. So you just say difference, and there you go. It's eclipse, yeah. <laughs> there you go, that's exactly how I made my thumbnail. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> All right, great, 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 great. Okay, so what we should do next. Do you have any suggestions, by the way, before we go to the next thing? So we have right now a 2D, 2D moon, but we're still coming to the 3D moon. I'm trying to go slowly with this, so there you go. Look at that. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. Okay, so next day, one to the moon phase. <laughs> So, all right, let's see. Let's see, let's see what I'd like to show you next. We can also change the radius of this guy dynamically. Uniform float inner circle radius. Yeah, you know, you just make uniforms like this. 
you put it instead of the hard-coded value and you just play with it you just have fun there you go there you go <laughs> that's pretty cool stuff we could also now the thing is that I didn't show you before I actually just forgot now the thing is in our shader we only have you know like a still image it doesn't move like it doesn't change uh, over time now I actually said this the actual keyword which is change over time right because well why then doesn't change it over time because we haven't included time in our equation right <laughs> So if you want to actually make things animate, you have to include time in the equation. So how we can do it? Well, in Godot, at least, you have a time constant. Well, yeah. The, and of course, that time it would be constant on all the pixels, but would change over time because it is literally time, right? <laughs> so let's actually include it somehow. Let's do some example, I guess. Uh, 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 let's make, for example, the inner circle radius change over time. So instead of the, this variable, let's go maybe with sine of, or let's go with time actually. Let's give it time directly. And this is what we get. <laughs> we get nothing. <laughs> because this circle is too big. <laughs> this time is in seconds. <laughs> and it's a very, very long time, right? <laughs> so now we here we are in dire need of some function that would take any value and maps it to some you know bounded range of output values and the best well not necessarily the best but something very simple that we usually do or that we can do is sine of x this function right here can take any value, whatever is it, whatever it is, right? And it can map it to the range zero to one, uh, well, minus one to one, sorry, right? But the problem though with this is that it maps it from minus one to one instead of zero to one. But let's start by this one, okay? So we're gonna say sine of time, right? So sine of time. Let's see what we get. And there you go. Let's make it smaller, right? So we could basically say 0 0.5 or what we can actually even do, we can do times that inner circle radius. There you go. Now I could actually change that, that thing, right? Let's go. So now we have an anim animation. The problem that you would see here actually is that it goes back into the negative direction because the sine wave goes from minus one to one. Well, let's remove this. It goes from minus one to one. So how we can actually map this function from zero to one instead? Well, there's two ways about to, to do this, right? Uh, there is the mathematical way that I'm gonna about to show you, right? And there's some way that we could do it in GLSL too, directly. So anyway, sine of x, now the first thing that the, the first problem we have is that the sine function, its magnitude, right? So the position from, you know, uh, hold on. So the position from here to here, from this line to this line, which is like the maximum and the minimum, is basically two, not one. You know, we have here one and you have here one. So the first thing that we need is to actually make the sine wave smaller twice, right? Like half the size or half the magnitude. So we can actually do this here. We could, you know, make some variable A right here that is time of that sine of X. And then we can change its magnitude however we want. So if we made it 0 0.5, we can halve the magnitude of the sine wave. And so now we have fixed the problem, uh, the first problem that we have, which is the fact that the sine wave magnitude is not correct for our purposes, right? So right now it's actually one magnitude. The next thing that we need to do is 
to make this function, instead of going from the negative to the positive, like this from minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5 in this case, we want it to go from 0 to 1 instead. So what we need to do here is to take this sine function and translate it up, right? So we actually have done this before with the circle, if you remember. So how we can do it here? Well, this is implicitly y equal to a sine of x, right? So this is a function, or f of x equal to, you know, you got the point, right? So how we can actually make this go up and down? <laughs> well, we would take, as I said before, we take the y value, every y value in the equation, or in the function, right? And we wrap it in parentheses. And then we can actually do minus some offset, right? In this case, we don't need the parentheses since it's alone, you know? Uh, but you got the point, so we can say some value b. And look at that. There you go. Now, if you want to take this b into the other direction, this is pretty simple math, you know, just take it to the other direction, reverse the sign, and there you go. Now, plus b, now we could actually use that b. We can actually make it into a point, in fact, um, 0 b. And we can actually take this function however we want. And now we can map it to exactly where we want. And there you go, it's 0 0.5, because we want to translate it up 0.5 times, right? So we can actually take that negative value to be, you know, positive right now. This is how you turn life, your life from negative to positive, by the way. <laughs> All right, so this is basically what we should do. Now let's actually inline these variables, right? So B is 0 0.5 and A is 0 0.5. Uh, okay, cool. So we don't need these variables anymore. So that's basically it. We halve the magnitude by multiplying by 0 0.5 and then we say plus, five, plus 0.5 uh, to actually translate it up 0.5 times. Now this, this sine function goes from 0 to 1. So we could just plug this uh, equation into our thing, right? So instead of sine time, well, we already say inner circle radius, you see? Well, we could just say 0 0.5, right? Plus 0.5, and there you go. So right now it actually goes from zero to one, no matter what the time is. So yeah, okay, cool. Now I think let's go to the next step, maybe. Hmm, should we go to 3D already? What do you guys think? <laughs> Should we go to 3D? Hopefully I explained enough. I tried to explain everything that I could, even basic math. So everyone, <laughs> my craft explosion. <laughs> All right, let's go to 3D, I guess. Okay, so remember the Pythagorean theorem of the circle, right? So it was x to the power of two, um, plus y to the power of 2, uh, less than r to the power of 2, which is the radius. Okay, remember this? Now, the thing is, this is a 2D circle, but we want a 3D circle. Well, basically a sphere, right? <laughs> so how we can actually do this? How we can actually do this? Well, I mean, to be honest, it's pretty simple. Like you can see this form, it's x to the power of 2 plus y to the power of 2. You know, just add plus z to the power of 2, right? Just add another dimension. It's not that hard, you know? <laughs> just add another dimension. It's that simple. But the problem is, we don't have a z position for our, for our pixel, you know? Our, our, our screen is not 3D, it's 2D, right? So how we can actually do this? Well, the thing is, we do have x, right? We do have y, and we do have r, but we don't have z. And when you have an equation like this, where you have one unknown, what you do? Well, you pretty much solve it. <laughs> it's that simple. <laughs> so what we could actually do, uh, we could take this r squared, right? Take it to the other part of the equation, so it will have the negative sign, right? So minus r squared, less than, oh, let's just remove that less than to not overcomplicate things, keep it equal for now, is equal to, and here we, well, honestly, you know what? No, I'm gonna do the opposite. Let's just move these x and y's to the other direction, right? So let's actually do this, okay, cool. 
let's put the z squared first and the other ones we're going to move them to the other direction but let's put r squared first and then say minus x squared right minus y squared oopsies there you go so right now we have actually got our z but it have a power off though so we can remove that power off by making a, a square, square root now let's go and this mouse had an actual minecraft explosion right now because <laughs> it this is this plot contains fine detail that has not been fully resolved <laughs> there you go uh, let's go like the, the graphical calculator have gone nuts right now because it just cannot do this you know this is javascript this is not gls <laughs> You know, so let's actually do it in our powerful calculator right here that we have here, the, the, our GPU, which can do all those calculations. So let's go ahead and do this. All right, so let's make our sphere, I guess, float sphere. You give it a UV. By the way, there's another thing that I want to show you before this, just a little thing just to be mindful of it, uh, which you can actually do. So basically, instead of having this radius right here, you can just make that into the UV itself. There is no need to actually pass a radius alone. Uh, so like, like here, for example, instead of passing UV, then 0 0.5 for the radius, you can actually remove the radius completely. Hmm, actually, not really, not, at least not in this not in this case because we still need the radius in it for the circle stuff right uh, but basically what I'm trying to say is that you can just like let's say I want to make this whole thing my whole painting smaller or larger or whatever right I could just do like multiply that UV that coordinate system by some number to scale it basically so if I scaled it by 0 0.5 you know it's gonna be smaller right 0 0.1 there you go actually no the opposite <laughs> my bad um, yeah pretty much there you go there you go so look at that it's much much smaller right now but this is just some little detail that I wanted to include there anyways let's go back to our sphere right now so we got the UV and we need the radius of course mm. Uh, let's forget about transitions right now and let's make a sphere so how are we gonna do this well mm, maybe let's start here so we got our X we got our Y uh, why did I call it a <laughs> for no reason anyways uh, so we have this and now what we could actually do so R times R minus A times A minus B times B. Otherwise, of course, you can also do this. Nah, but there's no need, I guess. So there you go. Oh, my bad. What I'm doing? Minus X times X. Uh, y times Y. Right? Cool. Now, let's actually return you know what this is this is the Z but before that we need to square root this to actually get the Z otherwise we're gonna get Z squared instead of Z so here we go we actually return the Z right now great so let's try this out so let's remove this donut for now and let's make a sphere here and it would be of UV yeah? and radius radius let's say 0 0.5 or right. yeah pretty much but honestly instead of putting it in the opacity let's put it on the color instead to make it more more visible I guess and there you go so this is what we get what we're actually seeing right now is the Z axis <laughs> from our X and Y so that's basically kind of like the shadow to some degree, right? You can see the silhouette, kind of. 
actually the shadow is a better way of describing it but I think you got the point so we're actually visualizing the z axis like the z value of the circle of, of the sphere right so the problem with this though is that this is not how light works yeah depth exactly <laughs> exactly depth we're seeing the depth of the sphere I don't know what's up with my English today on <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> uh, let's go. Uh, so there we go. We got a sphere. Okay. So the problem with this is that we don't want to actually see the depth because in real life we don't see the depth. You know, we see the lighting. You know, and of course that depth makes like the lighting treats it differently depending on depth, right? So how we can actually calculate lighting? Now <laughs> to actually calculate lighting is not easy at all. Cause like how lighting works, you basically like, you have like a lot of ray, light rays coming outside of light sources, right? And whenever that light ray hits something, it bounces, like it reflects from that thing, depending on its material and stuff. Um, and a lot of other factors. I'm not, I don't want to go into detail right now, but basically what you see with your own eyes or the camera, what, what the camera sees is basically just that light bouncing out of, uh, from light sources, bouncing out multiple bounces to your eyes. And that's essentially what is ray tracing RTX, you know? Uh, so actually GPUs today, uh, modern GPUs can actually do ray tracing, uh, which is quite realistic way of calculating lighting right uh, but my uh, like I'm broke so my GPU doesn't have RTX <laughs> doesn't have right ray tracing so not today <laughs> so for the most time of gaming you know and graphics programming in general we were just faking lighting and it was good enough honestly and it's still good enough for a lot of cases right so we use some models, right? So because the thing is, you know, you know what? We actually do not understand anything in the universe. All we have is just models <laughs> for everything. <laughs> and models basically trying to understand that thing. Like, I mean, as long as it works approximately, <laughs> should be good. <laughs> Until someone genius comes in and, you know, change everything. <laughs> like Einstein, <laughs> like from Newtonian physics to you know relativity and stuff but either way i've gone too deep in that <laughs> direction anyways let's go to fong shader model uh, or is it sh lighting model i think i'm not sure reflection model uh okay i see uh actually not this one this one is a little bit more advanced but learn OpenGL this is a good place to look into that yep th this is a little bit more okay there you go nice let's go so we got some illustrations here <laughs> so there you go you got the light source right the, the light comes in and it bounces right so if it bounces to the eye you actually see the light right and there you go and of course that light ray you know it's going to be a bit different depending on what light the material absorbs and what it reflects, right? So, and that's determined by its color. So like if you see as red, that means that that object have actually absorbed the green and the the blue light and it only lit, it only reflected the red light. So for example, plants that you see as green, they actually basically absorbs the red and the blue color, like the blue light and the red light as much, like a lot basically, and it reflects most, most of its light is basically green, right? And that's actually used for photosynthesis, right? To make its own energy and stuff. Either way, <laughs> this is not a biology course. Uh, anyways, so basically we try to just fake lighting as much as possible. That's what we do. <laughs> anyways, let's see. Uh, let's go to basic lighting right here. There you go. Okay, so so we want to calculate the diffuse right here. Okay, uh, so how we can actually do this? This is just an approximation of how light works, and there's no bounces, nothing, just a little bit of math. So how this works? Basically, 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 we're gonna have the light direction, right? The light vector, 
the light direction basically and we're gonna have the normal of the surface uh, that the light will hit right and we gotta calculate depending on the on that the light of course more uh, more advanced lighting would be using would be PBR which basically uh, calculates lights uh, like in a function of the material of that surface, right? Uh, that's more advanced anyways So let's actually try to do that. So the problem right now that we have first of all is that we need the normal of the surface The normal of the surface. So we actually have a sphere. So we're pretty much lucky <laughs> It's pretty easy to calculate the, the normal of the sphere. It's as simple as this is the, the normal pretty much vec3 normal is equal to vec3 x y z that's basically it <laughs> that's the normal at that point just x y and z that's pretty much it it's very simple okay so how can I can I give this normal that's a real question <laughs> well let's just cheat a bit I guess and make use of a vec4 I guess and you could say vec4 <laughs> vec uh, th the first vec3 would be the normal let's say and z in the vec4 uh, and there you go okay cool so now this actually would give me uh, let's grab this sphere right here let's call it I don't know a or I don't know right Invalid, oh my bad, Vic4. And now I could pass to this um, color, I could pass a dot RGB, so I could pass the, you know, the normal. Well, not my bad, not here. We actually want to use that normal for lighting, right? For calculating the lighting. So let's go back, Vic3 here, zero for now. Okay. Uh, so what's up? What's going on? Expected. Uh, where 25 oh my bad okay great so we have that out of the way so we have the normal which is RGB and we have the Z value which is a dot W uh, R a well, we can say a so all right let's just call this s I guess Uh, do we actually need the Z? No, we we actually do not in this case. At least not anymore, I think. Yep, probably. <laughs> so we don't even need to do that, actually. We can just return the normal directly. We don't need the Z. My bad. So this is our sphere normal. Mm-hmm, valid vec3, let's make this vec3, and no need for this anymore. Okay, so now let's actually calculate this diffuse lighting, all right? So how are we going to do this? First of all, we need some light direction. Um, let's just make a uniform value, uh, vec3, uh, light direction. So where the light is coming from, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. And now what we're gonna do yeah let's calculate the lighting right now float diffuse is equal to we're gonna use the dot product the dot product of the sphere normal with the light direction and let's just make sure that these are normalized uh, I think sphere normal should be normalized any well I guess maybe yeah it would depend on the R okay I see so let's actually just normalize this to make sure to do that. Um, normalize sphere normal and normalize the light direction. Hopefully this is understandable. Try to explain as much as possible. Um, okay. Now instead of... Huh, what the heck? Ah, I see. <laughs> what? Let's remove this. Okay, so instead of zero, let's actually set this to diffuse. And hmm, really? 
Uh, did I miss something here? Uh, oh, my bad. Light direction. Okay. <laughs> Let's remove these, by the way. We don't need them right now. Uh, we only need the position. And in fact, the position right now would become Vic3. Um, hmm. Let's just keep it Vic2 for now. Let's just remove these. And there you go. Okay, cool. Let's just make this, I guess, a zero, I guess. Or we could keep it 0 0.5, fine. And here what we got. That's the radius of the sphere. And yeah, now what? Now, uh, yeah, let's move the light direction right now. And look at that. There you go. So right now I could actually put in whatever light direction I want and this would work. I I don't think I need to normalize here actually. Do I? No, I don't think. Anyways, never mind. And what if I change this to 0 0.1? There you go. Interesting. Okay, cool. So that's the light direction. But the problem with this though is that I actually give the X and Y and Z of the light direction, which is kind of weird, right? Doesn't work so well with the uh, uh, spherical coordinates, right? So instead of using these kind of coordinates, like Cartesian coordinates, we can use um, spherical coordinates. So instead of giving it these values, we can give it the angles of the light direction, right? Which is way better. So here's how we could do it. Spherical search up spherical coordinates and go ahead, find its parametric equation. There you, well, not this one, <laughs> that's cylindrical. Uh, come on, come on, come on. Where's the, I know it, but I need to show you. Hmm. This is the matrix multiplication version. Uh, I just want, what the heck? Why it's giving me cylindrical in spherical coordinates? <laughs> what the heck? Yeah, I am in the right place. What the heck? Anyways, uh, oh, there you go, okay. <laughs> there you go, so conversely, the Cartesian coordinates may be, retrie may be retrieved from the spherical coordinates, radius r, inclination, and azimuth. Hopefully I didn't butcher that name. And uh, where r is in the range from zero inclusive to infinity, of course, exclusive. <laughs> and here, the inclination is between in the range 0 and pi and the azimuth is in the range from 0 to pi to 2 pi right and there you go so the x is equal to r times sine of theta i guess inclination right cosine azimuth right and stuff like that all right so let's actually put that there let's make another function I guess called uh, spherical coordinates, spherical chords, mm -hmm. and this would basically take the inclination, well, yeah, inclination, right, and it would take the azimuth. Or instead of this, we could just take a Vic2, actually. Vic2 angles, <laughs> pretty much. And we can return a Vic3, and now we can calculate that, right? So we have the angles, and we want to calculate the x, y, and z. So let's actually do this. So sine of angles dot x. So let's start by simple polar coordinates, which is basically spherical coordinate, but in 2D. So this is for a circle, right? It's as simple as 
actually let's go with cosine first angles dot y Mm, let's just reverse it. I don't care. And let's go with sine angles dot y. This is basic polar coordinates, right? Just in 2D. And now let's actually add the third dimension. So to add the third dimension, oh, my bad. What I'm doing, x here. So to add the third dimension, we're just going to say here times sine of the second angle times sine of the second angle once again and finally in the z though we will have cosine instead of sine angles dot y that's how i remember it personally so i start by polar coordinates then extend it to 3d uh found parentheses close what the heck oh it doesn't support trailing commas interesting Okay, cool. So let's actually use the spherical coordinates instead of this weird light direction. So let's just go with light. Instead of light direction, we're going to go with light angles to make this way better to control. Mm -hmm. And here we're just going to basically, instead of normalized light direction, uh, we can just say spherical chords. So we're going to take Cartesian well, not Cartesian, we're going to take angles, you know, and basically spherical coordinates into Cartesian coordinates and feed it into the dot product here. So the angles would be, well, pretty much the light angles. And we don't have any R, I'm sure this would be normalized 100%. Okay, so let's actually play with this light angles now. Uh, but here we got, I think, what is it called again? <laughs> um... Euler axis lock or something, I don't know. But basically, we need to change this this angle first, then we can change that, because otherwise we're not gonna see a difference here. But let's change this first, look at that. Now I can actually change the angle however I want. There you go. That's the first angle, right? The second angle, there you go. There you go. We. I can also, let's say, hmm, let's change this depending on the time. Let's animate it. So we're going to change time, uh, angle over time. Uh, 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 okay. So let's say plus. Sign of time. <laughs> this is plus sign of time, but we don't need sign of time. An angle is already that way, I guess. And there you go. Now we're adding time to the second angle. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. Now, as a final touch, what we need more is some, let's say, some texture because the moon, you know, it's not like smooth like my head right now. It's not smooth like my bald head. <laughs> we need to add some texture to it. Uh, so, let's add some noise. Noise is fun. So this would depend on which shading language and stuff. I mean, you can actually go ahead to the internet, you know, and find some fancy noise function, right? GLSL noise function, GLSL noise algorithm, right? And just take it, copy, paste it into your code and use that function, right? Uh, you don't need to worry about its implementation Trust me, you don't want to worry about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so instead of that, though, we actually have in Godot, uh, we can actually make a sampler, right? And make a noise 
noise texture here in the engine itself. So that's what I'm going to do personally. Uh, uniform Sampler 2D. And by the way, the reason I'm actually able to change these uniforms, the yeah, craters, exactly. Though it's not going to be some interesting crater, some realistic, it's just going to be something simple, pretty much. Uh, just some little noise, and that's it, pretty much. Um, so, the, as I said, uh, by the way, why I can change these uniforms, I mean, this thing right here is actually running in the GPU right now, in my GPU. That's, that's shaders where they run, right? Of course, after compiling it and such, right? Um, but... The thing is about these uniforms is that there are variables that you can actually like the uniforms is the way you can you can put some variables from the CPU to the GPU right so that's basically what uniform is that's why I can actually change it from here and it basically does its thing right anyways so uniform sampler 2d and let's just make some mm, let's call it craters as OG G gear instead <laughs> Okay, and let's see. So we got a sampler 2D here. Now let's actually make the sampler. So Go.Engine gives me a lot of options. It even gives me the option to use my camera. <laughs> I think I'm gonna try this. I never tried it, but maybe we can <laughs> My face on the moon. <laughs> So that's gonna be, that's gonna be sick. <laughs> Anyways, um, let's go to uh, let's see gradient camera texture. Uh, yeah, let's go to noise noise right now. Noise texture two D, and here we can actually choose the resolution of the noise texture. Uh, so let's actually. I think this should be fine. In 3D space, I'm not sure what this does. Determines whether the noise image is calculated in 3D space may result in reduced contrast. Generated mid-map, seamless. I do need seamless. Uh, but actually, let's leave it off for now until I show you why. As normal map, normalize. Yeah, sure, we can also add a color ramp, a gradient which is used to map the luminance of each pixel to a color value. Uh, then we can also do that inside of the the shader but it would be better if we do it in the, the texture directly first but anyways let's actually make a new fi fast noise light here you can use simplex smooth or cellular oh actually cellular is way better for this maybe hmm. perlin value cubic hmm, what do you guys think which is the best one for creators i think cellular is actually w better I was actually gonna use Perlin, but I feel like Solar is better for this. And you can change the frequency of this noise. There you go. We can also change the offset of this noise. And this basically gets generated offline and then we can basically sample it in the shader. So fractal type FBM, blah, 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 lacanarity. And you can basically make a lot of cool stuff here anyway. Cellular domain, oh crap, nice. Euclidean squared or Manhattan or hybrid. Interesting stuff. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff to play with here, uh, but that's pretty cool. That's how I actually learn. I just play with values and see what it does. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, let's go ahead and do this. So, now the thing is we have our diffuse lighting. And if we actually go back to that op Learn OpenGL page, uh, we have multiple layers of lights here. We have the ambient, uh, because the thing is, if you notice here, anything that doesn't have light in it, it's completely dark, right? It's completely black which is not usually the case in real life because a lot of times, like, I mean, all the time, <laughs> you'll have some light bouncing around to, um, and then like just bouncing around until it goes to the, to, to the other side of the light, right? That's why you can see some light, even like, even if the light is here, you can see, you can still see some light in the back of the sphere, right? Uh, because of the light bouncing. 
Uh, but we don't have here light balancing and such. We just have some simple mathematical expressions to fake it. <laughs> so how we can do this? Well, we just simply just do something very simple in this case, though there is more advanced ways to do this. Uh, but the simplest way is to just add a constant color as an ambient. Uh, so you don't have that pitch black. Uh, so let's actually do that. So diffuse. Uh, let's make an ambient here is equal to, I don't know, let's see, 0 0.5, 0 0.1 maybe. Huh? No, no, not here. I should put it in. Well, first of all, I think let's make this. Yeah, let's make this transparent. Let's just make here a color. Uh, what I'm doing, hold on. Honestly, never mind. Let's just keep it as it was. Uh, but what's up with this ambient right now? Oh, weird. Huh. Um. Hmm. Did I miss something here? That doesn't look, look right to me. <laughs> I probably have missed something. Da -da 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 -da. What? <laughs> I'm very confused right now. Hmm. <laughs> what I'm missing. Oh, oh, I think I know. I think I know. Now, the thing is about this dot product, though, <laughs> is that it goes negative. When it's on the other side, it goes negative, right? So I should make sure to actually keep this, like to clamp this into positive values only. So I could just say, not really absolute. Uh, let's say clamp, right? So, and I can clamp this from a minimum value to a maximum value. Or we could probably just use, instead of clamp, we could also use mm, minimum. Minimum, comma, 0, 0.0. Uh, oh, my bad. Maximum, actually. My bad. <laughs> maximum. Use maximum to get a minimum. <laughs> so, yeah. And we can actually, yeah, we can make use of the sphere Z here to, for the transparency. Mm -mm -mm. I mean, yeah. So maybe let's make this a Vic 4, right? And let's, Oh, what I'm doing, hold on. Yeah, that's good. Actually, hold on, what the heck? I mean, the Z is already in there. <laughs> the Z is already in the normal, <laughs> my bet. Uh, I'm losing my mind right now. <laughs> For the built-in, okay, cool, never mind. The Z value is already part of the normal since it's a sphere. Bright side looks clamped. Yeah, yeah, pretty much because we're adding ambience for everything, which is, shouldn't be the case. Uh, but hold on a second. So we can actually make use of, I guess, the sphere normal dot Z to make this transparent. Let's make, let's change the background here a bit. Uh, clear color, right? Clear rendering environment, yeah. Uh, 
Okay. Hmm. What if I have 0 0.5 now? There you go. Look at that ambient. All right. Actually, no, that looks weird. No, 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 that looks weird. Yeah, I know why. I know why. I need to actually use, um, uh, what is it called? Step, yeah. 0 0.5. Um, is it? Mm. What? Not really. Hmm. Weird. So I want to step this. Um. You know what, let's just go with 1.0 for now here. Da, 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 da. And... Honestly, let's forget about ambient for now anyways. <laughs> uh, I need to find a way to do that. But you know, an identifier and expression, yeah, let's remove it. We can also add... Um, another thing which is the specular but I don't think you want that in a moon so never mind uh, but anyways okay so let's actually do the noise right now <laughs> let's do the noise so diffuse times texture this is how you sample a texture so texture and you give it a sampler uh, which is gonna be craters in this case it's called craters and here you give it where you want to sample the texture. Uh, let's just say UV, I guess. Invalid. Oh, yeah. So the texture returns RGBA, but here we only want one channel. There you go. The problem, though, with this is that it goes from 0 to 1. Okay. Which is like craters are not, you know, either dark or. Uh, so we need to change the range of that color. I think I've seen something for it here. I mean, we can do it in shader, but uh, let's see here real quick, because I'm pretty sure maybe I've seen it. Maybe it's either color ramp. Yeah, it's probably color ramp. Let's try this one. Hmm, is it? Mm, I don't think it is. No, not what I want. But like you can use this to actually change, let's say, the color to something else. But anyways, whatever. This is not exactly what I want. Fast noise, light. Ba -ba -da -ba -ba. Uh, don't know what I was... Anyways, let's just do it in the shader, to be honest with you. So remember when I was talking about the sine wave? like here, uh, when we had the sine x function, right? So, yeah, and to actually change the range of it, we have done this. Uh, now you can actually do the same exact thing by using a function called, uh, 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 don't know what the heck is wrong with me forget a lot right now mm -hmm. probably needing the, another coffee <laughs> uh, let's see what the heck it is called <laughs> mm. 
mix exactly mix yeah so there's this mix function right here that we can actually use to do the same exact thing so mix linear interpolate between a and b by c right so we could use that texture thing as the interpolation as c basically there so anyways let's say mix uh mix there you go and let's actually say we're gonna mix it from zero to one right now right now we haven't changed anything you know we just have more variables to work with right we haven't changed any this is the exact same thing as it was before but right now we can actually change these instead of from zero to one we can actually change it to something else like we can instead of starting from zero we can actually start from 0 0.5 for example or maybe 0 0.2 let's make the speed of this maybe a little bit faster we can also change the speed by multiplying the time to change the frequency you know there you go I don't know if this would look actually good uh, but maybe we can also take that sampling of the texture and multiply it by the depth I have never tried this but let's just see how this would go um I don't think that's good <laughs> okay by the way let me make sure to normalize this here instead hmm does it even make any difference at all good question not entirely sure but let's just remove it for now actually it does make a difference times two let's make it even bigger oh crap what <laughs> what is even that uh, interesting well anyways let's just remove that honestly but yeah there you go light angles you can actually change that and we got a moon kind of simple moon <laughs> uh, let's say maybe 0 0.3 we can play with the noise here Could play all with all sorts of crazy stuff honestly let's remove that time stuff because it made me nauseous uh, let's remove this guy oh crap what where this ends there you go okay cool nice so let's play with this a bit maybe we can make it can make the resolution bigger we need that but I don't think I need that do I I don't know uh, either way let's see the other stuff now it doesn't seem like I needed seamless for some reason <laughs> not sure why either way we can also do simplex Siller, which is what we had and Perlin Siller is the best I think in this case can also change the frequency look at that I can also change the fractal type this is ping pong <laughs> this is ridged this is FBM the octaves is how much detail is in there uh, so if it's one look at that <laughs> if you get two you get more detail in a smaller frequency and so on the more you add there 
I think four is actually quite good. Maybe five, not the best in details. <laughs> Lacunarity, this is what it does. But yeah, you just go wild with these values and you see what you get. The gain and the weighted string. The distance function, Euclidean, Euclidean squared, Manhattan, and hybrid. Uh, return type distance or... S oh crap, look at that! So changing it from distance to cell value, this is what we get. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. Alright. Distance to, no clue it's that. Distance to add, to sub, ooh. There you go, your mountains. <laughs> this is to mole, this is to div. That looks like glass right now, or I don't know. And that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool, distance. There's even this domain wrap, which I'm not sure what it is, it is about. I don't see a difference. Yeah, I cannot notice the difference. I do see a bit of a difference, but like changing these values doesn't seem to change anything much. But yeah, that I think that was it for the stream pretty much. That was a lot of cool stuff. And yeah, we got a little simple moon. Uh, we started from scratch and we got here pretty much. You can change the light angles and stuff. You can change the position of the moon and so on. So yeah, I think that was it for this stream. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks for Whoa GG Tikiran for tuning in. Thanks for Lotfi. And thanks for Hinock and Theo Paris. Yo Yo Man 3D and Gavin Tranquilino. Thank you guys for coming in and see you in the next one. Goodbye, everyone.